Studentpreneur, the podcast about students who are entrepreneurs. Get motivated and keep your energy high. Stories from Studentpreneurs. This episode is sponsored by ID Network, a network of university associations run by studentpreneurs for studentpreneurs. Visit idnetwork.com.au. Welcome to episode 8. My name is Julian Marchand, entrepreneur turned PhD student. Each week, I bring you the best of those individuals who are students and entrepreneurs. I call them studentpreneur. This week, our studentpreneur is Stephen Esketsis. So Stephen, you currently uh, enroll at uh, Dinkin University in Melbourne, and you are doing a Bachelor of Commerce, and you've also running uh, your own business, and you had uh, a turnover of five to six figures. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Excellent. After this little intro, do you want to tell us a bit more about your current business? Yeah. So what I'm doing right now, I'm currently an online marketer. I've got a software at the moment. Uh, it's a software as a service. So it's in the cloud where I help artists from all over the world market themselves online. So I've worked with a developer to produce this software called Tractasia. And what we do is we allow artists, DJs, musicians to get their fan base on social media. And when they give away free music, It'll also help them to uh, grow their Facebook page, their Twitter followers, their SoundCloud account. And that's a monthly service. So they pay monthly for that. And yeah, that's my primary business. And I also work in online marketing. So I help other business owners uh, create their sales funnel. So that's pretty much their sales process, how they want to sell, how they attract customers, and how to make money for their business attract leads all online. Cool. So for Attract Asia, you basically deal with... People are not very social media savvy, but they know they need to be strong there, right? Correct. Yeah. So one of the biggest issues for artists is that they can't get a following. And it all stems from a following is the core issue. If you're a musician or an artist or a DJ who wants to, uh, to make it, who wants to get bigger, who wants to get paid for their work, because you can see or someone who's going to pay you to play at their event isn't going to be interested in people who can't bring a crowd to the event because it all comes down to money ultimately. I mean, if someone wants to book you for an event, you've got to be able to attract people to the event. So they're not going to pay you to come to the event if you don't have a fan base behind you. And the artists really struggle with that. It's funny you mentioned you mention an event. It's because there's no more money to be made in selling singles. You have to bring them to the event. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, it works for record labels as well. I mean, they, if you're a label who you want to release a song online, you have behind it that'll purchase it. So you've really really be a good following, have a tribe out there that's willing to enjoy music, interact with you and engage with you. But how much better are you from uh, MySpace, right? They all have MySpace, right? I haven't actually touched MySpace in years. I think (laughs) I had a MySpace at 10 years old and I don't think, it might still exist, I don't even know, but that's, uh, (laughs) it's long gone. Now I think SoundCloud's probably the the platform of choice for these artists. Ah, yeah, SoundCloud, that's, that's a good one, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So you, you're, you're running Track Asia now, but how did you get there? How did you get started? Was it in high school? Did you sell stuff? Did you, what did you do? Yeah, so I've really had this entrepreneurial gene since I was born, I guess. Like, I think <laughs> Okay, born. I've always sort of been this uh, hustle sort of person that has to do business, something business savvy. So um, I think all like from primary school, even like hustling Yu-Gi-Oh cards and Pokemon cards. I don't know if you know them, but yep. it's just swapping them and selling them and getting the better ones and getting up there. And then I think in high school, I was known for uh, selling cans, so like Coke cans, soft drink. What I'd do is at the tuck shop, which is where everyone buys food and the canteen, they sold them for like $3 and they had a monopoly. Obviously, they were the only people that could sell drinks. So what did I do? I went to uh, Coles down the road, bought three uh, of those big 24 packs, stacked them all in my locker. (laughs) I think it cost me about $14 or $13 for about cans. So I had about 70 cans sitting in one of my lockers at school. And then (laughs) at lunchtime, I'd go around, sell them all for a dollar each. And then I'd sell out every lunchtime. So I'd make about $40 or $50 every lunchtime just by selling these cans around the school. Oh my God, that's Um, that's a monthly uh, cash money. Yeah, (laughs) that's it. It's cash money. So... Every week, I think I banked about a couple of hundred dollars and just from selling cans around lunchtime. And then after a few, the reputation for it. So people started coming to me and cheaper than the other, than the tuck shop. And then I didn't even have to do it. And that's sort of where it just, I really enjoyed that. That was part of like the highlight of part of my school time there. And then that sort of evolved. So what did you like? Did you like the reputation itself? Like people coming to you for something? Oh, I love the attention, but yeah. um, it was all like, I think... Uh, 
I don't know. For me, I think it's the actual deal making. Being in business, just really clenching that deal and making sale is, I think, where I get my adrenaline from. So it, it doesn't have to be cans, doesn't have to be DJs, doesn't have to be anything. I know I just get an adrenaline from selling, I guess. And that's why I think, like, whether it's selling online, selling in person, you get that adrenaline from just making sale. And I think it all comes down to that. So whatever business you're in, you've got to be, you can really, you're dealing with people no matter what the product is. And the selling part in a business is the most important one. It's the one that you don't learn at school. Well, that's right. I mean, there is no business if you're not selling. The cash register has to be going for the business to be open. So I like it. <laughs> I'm going to, I mean, I, we've got a short title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely uh, an issue which a lot of business thing. And I'm still like every day, you, you can never be the perfect thing. And initially, when I was a lot younger as well, thinking that I, was, I knew everything to sales and this and that, but you just, Affecting the skill if you want to, to make money in it. I know that like every single day I'm listening to audiobooks, podcasts, reading blogs, right? And it just keeps building up and self teaching and learning all those skills that it takes to, uh, to make a sale. Yeah, awesome. So after selling cans, what did you do? So after that, I got into uni. I started in at Monash University for my first year. And then that was in, in Melbourne, in Clayton. I started in a Bachelor of Business Information Systems. So what I really wanted to do was how to use technology for businesses and how to let them leverage technology. And I thought that's what it was going into the course. But I soon found out that it was a whole lot of coding and jargon <laughs> and stuff that I didn't understand. <laughs> so I, uh, I quickly got out of that. I was in it for a year. So my grades, I think I failed four or five subjects out of eight. So I, th I just dropped out of a couple and oh, it was just horrible. And the ones I passed were all electives, so ones outside of the course. <laughs> and I got good scores. So I did like, I don't know, distinctions, high distinctions, did pretty well. But during that year, I started my first company, first official company, and that was Meggle. So Meggle was an iPhone app which allowed people around Melbourne to use guest lists to get into nightclubs. So essentially clubbing to go out to a bar or a nightclub they have promoters at these nightclubs. And these promoters have a guest list, which if you say that at the door, you'll be able to get a discount upon your entry. So you might save five or 10 bucks. So what we did was we found that a lot of people went out not knowing what all these guest lists were. So if you're new to the city or if you're going to a new nightclub, what we would do, we created a central hub where these promoters could sign up, submit their guest lists and associate it with the club they promote for. And then people could just scroll through and see which guest lists were available at which nightclub. So that was the, my first sort of venture. Did that come from like your personal hobby? Like did you go to nightclub well, as well? Or? I guess after university and beginning of first year, I went out clubbing a bit as most first years do and yep. went out partying and all that. But um, yeah, that's sort of I guess where I saw it. I was really aching to get something off the ground as soon as possible. And I was sort of just looking around and I had that idea. Another friend I went to school with who were at the same university I approached him and said, look, what do you think of this idea? I think it might have some potential. I think we can get it off the ground. And it was an Apple, an app as well. So yeah. I'd never touched an app in my life. I had no idea how an app worked. I had no idea how to register a business. I was <laughs> someone that's really like, like, oh, don't get me wrong. I love the selling and stuff, but I had no technical knowledge of how to begin a business and anything like that or an app. It's okay. You were doing an IT degree, right? <laughs> I, I wish I don't think I don't know if you can say I was doing it but I was enrolled in it so I think there's a, a fine line but um yeah so that's what happened there I just I went out obviously saw a need and I thought look we really uh solve this problem so we started building this app we started looking online what did we need to do how do we do a logo trademark it there's because as you know um, and I'm sure some of your other audience would know that there's a lot of things that you just don't know what to do when you get started it's pretty daunting So we spent a lot of time finding all those things out. We started calling the different government agencies saying, do we need a business name, a company name, an ABN, a tax file number? Just, oh, it was just brutal. But All the fun stuff. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But the thing is, you've got to do it. And that's part of the, uh, I think, I'm glad I did that earlier rather than later. Because yeah, that's right. Yeah. If I put it off or if I had an idea now and you just have to do it and that's work you can't get around. I mean, the real basics and the core concepts of starting a business and something you just got to go out and experience because no one's going to, you can't pay someone to do it for you. But I understand if you want to be in business. But once you've done it once, then it's actually quite easy to do it a second time and you know, you can plan for it really. Of course. Yeah. So if you want to start a second business, you've got to, if you want to close down the business, whatever you want to do, there's definitely, you can just follow the same route. It's just a rinse and repeat. 
Or you you keep the same uh, ABN number and you open different names <laughs> for different yeah. businesses. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> so you can have multiple business names and uh, yeah, you can make that pretty big. So yeah, but that's how we started. So uh, we came up. Well, he was studying a commerce and law degree, so he was sort of good with the paperwork and the things like that. Whereas I was more tech savvy, so I could relate to the app and things like that. And then we got it off the ground. I don't know a thing about programming. I hate programming, and I don't know. I'd love to stay away from that sort of stuff. So what we did was we thought, let's get some quotes. We looked around. Australian companies, ridiculously expensive, we found out. <laughs> yes. Um, and so we were looking, I think, like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars and we're like, rip off. Let's have a look to outsource it. Just sort of dibbled and dabbled with outsourcing online. So things like to the Philippines, China, to India. There's a dude in odesk.com. Yeah. And they pretty much, you can outsource virtual there. And we jumped on there. This is the first time I, I was on there. So... I put the job out saying, look, this is what we want. At about, I think within the first 24 hours, about 30 people, percent of them were from India. And I think 10% were from China that uh, the job to get it done. And they started as low as like $150 all the way up to 2000 And being yourself, it's definitely, there's a lot of thing going into when you hire someone from overseas. And that was the first proper hire I think I ever did for a job, which we learned that hire. I'll, I'll say that. Because with a, there's a big language barrier if you're overseas, you need to make sure you, it's very clearly labeled. But yeah, first prototype out after about two or three months, I think. Okay, two or three months. Yeah, so it took a little while after the hiring and finding what we need to do. We ran into things specific if you, for what you want to get out of a project like that. So we didn't realize that each screen on our app and handwritten, we had to know where the button was going, what color it would be. Yeah. What pages lead to what pages, what the functionality behind each button would be. And we thought, oh, wow, that we didn't estimate, like we were underestimated. It's funny that you say that because if you outsource, you need to stipulate everything. As you said, you need to hand draw yourself the file frame and each screen and explain each button yourself because otherwise, how are they going to understand what you want? Exactly right. You're right on the money. And that's the thing. We, you're paying 20 grand here in Australia. You can meet someone face to face and discuss that. Yes. Um, but, but us two uni students, it was all self funded as well. It was just, so we spent some money on that. I think we spent about a couple of thousand dollars, two thousand dollars in total, so something like that. And then, um, yeah, we we had to write out. We tried doing a Skype call with the guy, and he couldn't speak a word of English, so that was off the table. Oh wow! <laughs> it was really really tough because we at the beginning we didn't know. We only spoke with him and interviewed him on chat because he was one of the cheapest and we thought his examples and portfolio were good. Yeah. And didn't have a lot to go on, but it took us a long time to get a, something working that we, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, it's a good experience differently going forward. So we got our first prototype. We tested it, was going, and then after we launched it, we realized there were a lot of things that the market liked, about I think three or 4,000 users on the app. So it was quite good. Oh, that that's was good. over yeah. about four or five months time. A lot of advertising, talking to people, telling people to get a page and on Facebook and all these little things. But yeah, and we, we realized a lot of need for it. But one of the big issues was that anymore or the promoters just didn't bother adding their list on. There are a lot of the promoters or nightclubs, they either stopped promoting for the venue, but their guest list was still on the app. So when people arrived to the club, they said, okay, I'm with James. Then they said, well, there's no James at this nightclub promoting. And then oh, they were... Tch. The app gets a bad reputation. And yeah. So there were a few little things that we needed to fix up. And then we decided to change developer. Yeah. So we looked for someone new. And It's funny you say that because I think it's a really good example. Like Odesk is awesome to get your prototype. Yeah. But, that, but after that, <laughs> if you want your, the real product, yeah. you have to pay for it. Yeah, of course. I mean, look, that was for us, that was my very first business, my very first partner's business as well. We both just sort of had, we jumped in the deep end. And I think that's probably the best way to do it. I, I wouldn't have changed that, I tried it, because you need to learn those things before yeah. you can move forward. There's no doubt that you're better off doing that than reading and reading and researching and reading and rather than the money up front. So I'm not trying to say spend three grand on someone in India who doesn't speak English, but <laughs> keep in mind that you're going to get a better experience and understanding works when you do put your money out there and you actually spend time and you're all in. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That was uh, the app Meggle. And then that evolved for a whole year and we played around. We, we ended up finding someone in Melbourne who was a student actually who we got on board and we paid him to redo the app, which was fantastic. He was a great developer. And then after about a year and a half, the app was doing quite well. 
the app was doing quite well. And then we sort of let it go a little bit. My partner had some, we had a bit of a chat and we decided to go our separate ways. Yep. Didn't have any arguments and things like that. But yeah, the app sort of passionate about it as we, we were originally. So we, we went our separate people. So I took it over. And then after that happened, we began interviewing some artists to just build up some content on our on the website. So started interviewing DJs from Melbourne. I'm not sure if there's DJs from Australia, Will Sparks, Joel Fletcher. I don't know if your audience are familiar with those. Yeah. But we interviewed, yeah, a lot of these DJs from Melbourne and from Australia and even touring artists from overseas. So names that ended up coming here and we just interviewed them on video and had a laugh with them and people really enjoyed that. And that's really when it clicked that putting out really built that fan base. So just giving all this value to Ah, so that was your haha moment. Like you saw yeah, that's right. how to grab the followers. Yeah, that's right. So the app was still in the background. Like I wasn't touching it. It was just sitting on the app store. But that's when we were focused into uh, all this live content. So we'd speak to the agent, say, look, we'd love to interview one of your artists live on like a Google Hangout. And then they'd say, yeah, sure, no problem. We'd go in and set up, do a 30, 60 minute interview. The people who are watching could ask questions as well. The artist would promote it to his fan base, who was usually quite established. Yep. And we'd start slowly building up a bit of a fan base as well and followers. So that way, if we tried to do this once a week, people would stay on and watch for next week's interview and next week's interview. So we slowly built a community, built a fan base. That went quite well for a little while. But then the issue was that it wasn't monetizable. We couldn't find a way to monetize it. <laughs> That's the sales guys in you that realized this how long into the project? <laughs> <laughs> It took about a year and a bit to realize that, look, we had a great following and our aim wasn't to monetize straight off the bat. Yeah. But at the same time, I was quite naive in thinking that I could just flip it and start charging because obviously that's not how it works. So what happened with that is we still do the odd interview every now and again, but we don't do it with the aim of making money out of it really. So now it's more just a community thing. So okay. then that yeah. transferred and there's a lot of sort of levels into, into the company, how we've sort of changed visions. But then after that, after I realized that, look, there's no real way to monetize this. We're doing all these interviews. I'm spending a lot of time. There's a lot of editing, a lot of photos. Yeah, It's, it's a lot of time and it takes time away from other projects because I had a lot of other opportunities to join businesses and start businesses, which I could see an immediate return on investment. And then I was also sort of thinking, well, what's the opportunity that I can start spending some time into something else, which will have an ROI? And it's sort of, it's hard to do that when you're in a business. You need to sort of step back and take a look and think, all right, well, where does it go? Do I keep doing this until I get 100 and I can start monetizing it? Or should I really move my energy and time towards something else? And for me, I made the decision that, okay, it's time to move into something else and have a monetizable model from the start. And then we moved into Tractation now, which... Okay, so that's one, th that you made a decision to stop the app and to start a new business, basically. Correct, yeah. yeah. So it was in the same industry. So we had the same target audience, same target market, which they were still familiar with us. Yeah. And then we rebranded it Tractasia, which was something completely new, something completely fresh. And that was something that no one was familiar with, but they still knew the guys from Megal, our original company, were the ones who launched it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. That was so it gave us a bit of a bridge between the two different businesses there. And then... Yeah, so now I was a lot wiser in developing a software and one big thing for me is I value my time a lot and I don't like spending time on things which I don't get paid for and it's time on things which I don't see a lot of value getting done. So I like to work in things that I'm good at like the sales and the marketing and outsource the rest. So that's why with Tractasia, I hired two developers, really good developers to start working on the software and I liaised with them, paid them a certain amount to build the software and then got the design developed, all of that, and then launched the software after about three months. Oh, wow. And that's, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. So the first version came out after three months. And it was actually, it's pretty recent. I mean, it's only been out for a couple of months now, three, two or three months now. So that wasn't too long ago. Yeah. And then we started launching that. And the beauty of that is that now we can target people from all over the world. So there's no restriction to just Melbourne, just nice. Australia. Yeah. It's monetizable. So there's a whole month. People pay per month, so it's a recurring revenue model as well. And it's something which has a direct impact on the artist as well. So <laughs> yeah. there's no way of getting around this. If they want to become successful, they've got to see that the issue is it's not that they can't get signed to a, an agency. It's not the issue that they can't get to a record label. It all stems from having a following. And once you have a following, people recognize you and value your time. It sounds like um, your previous business, it was not 
it was not money on the table straight away, but what you paid for was the experience and understanding of the industry, really. 100%, yeah. So that way it gives you a real good understanding. For me, it gave me a real good understanding of the industry. It allowed me to really see where the issues were, how to overcome them. And it not only helped me overcome them, but I made some real good connections in the industry. Yeah, and that's of one of the most valuable parts of being in business is the connections, who you know, not what you know. So for me, when we started speaking with agencies for these big artists we were interviewing, when I went back and said, look, we're launching this software that's helping artists grow their fan base, a lot of them said, wow, that's awesome. Shoot me an email. Yeah. I'll, I'll get my entire uh, roster. So there might be 20 artists all into it. Yeah, because they all need it. They all need it. Exactly. They, they, they don't know how to do it. So That's right. They want so to do music, was, not social media. <laughs> 100%. So they want to work in their genius, which is making music. So leave the marketing and the music and the marketing and the social media to me. That's because right. Because that's what we wanted. So that allows us to, um, yeah, really work and scale this as well. So one big thing was the actual leverage of the software. So there was no more of my time being spent going out, yeah. interviewing, preparing, editing. It's all in the software. So It's all in the software. Ah, so you've automated everything. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So now I spend my time on growing Tractasia, the business, and acquiring customers to Tractasia and building their fan base. And that's where my time is best spent, and that's where I get the most value out of my time. So what are the key skills or takeaways that you transferred from Megal to this business? Looking back now. Yeah, that's a great question. One of the big things is that I don't know if I would say I'd really change what I did, but I think you have to learn the ropes in any industry. So you always have to start at the bottom. And I think we really did start at the bottom. So when we were doing Megal with the app initially, we were going out to nightclubs at 2 a.m. in the morning, walking around, handing out business cards to people saying, use this guest list or download this app. And we were doing that for two or three hours every weekend between like 4 a.m. in the morning. Wow. And we'd have like T-shirts on saying like Megal app. And my partner and I would just go down. <laughs> After he finished work at like a bar, we'd yeah. get in the car. He'd yeah. meet at my house. We'd go to the city and just go around handing out cards. Did you get to have a, have a drink at least? Oh, it was horrible. It was like <laughs> he was driving. He was a designated driver. I didn't even drink because we didn't go into the clubs. We just walked around the street. Because once they're in, they won't use the app. That's true. So we had That's to just true. keep walking around the all these nightclubs. And yeah. it was just brutal because now looking back, obviously, there was no success in that marketing whatsoever. It was people just either really drunk, they'd go there, they couldn't be bothered. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to be approached by some random saying to download this app when I'm just going out with my friends. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But not that late in, in any way. So the whole thing was a bit of a mess. But looking back on that, you really reflect on that if you didn't do that, you wouldn't see the experience and the value in it. And that's yes, why yeah. we moved online. And I'd be in the meantime, while all this was going on, I was self learning a lot of online marketing. So, a lot of uh, Facebook ads, how to acquire customers, lead generation, all of this sort of stuff, I was just learning in my spare time. So, sales. Time. Yeah. 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 We'll get on to it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and that all sort of really showed me that hang on, now I need to go to the path of least resistance, which is moving this experience online, targeting people yeah. from all over the world, building a model where I can actually get paid for my time allowing my time to be spent the best way possible and I can do all this and be rewarded a lot higher for it. Yeah, it sounds like the key skills or the key takeaway was you've learned what were your key skills and whatever you could outsource. And it's, you know, like we've interviewed quite a few people on this podcast who are going the same way, like Odesk and Freelancer are like the best tools they use and, and you develop your software to automate most of those processes. So it's... No, that's that's very powerful, and you've done it at like you know so young already. You got to learn the rope of the industry at the age of nineteen, twenty, like that. You know, you haven't lost time at all. Yeah, well, so that's I think one of my issues is I feel like every year I get older, I feel like I'm already behind the eight ball. So I don't know, it must be a curse. <laughs> like being, I'm currently twenty one now, and I feel like I'm way behind. And there's oh, eighteen yeah. year olds out there that are just <laughs> dominating. So. Like literally, there's no excuse to stop learning or stop working no. because there's some 18-year-old that's just killing it yep. and uh, is always going to be on your back. So for oh. me, if I can get more done in a shorter amount of time, that's awesome. That's good. So, and in all those business, all those different experiences, how did you manage to study and run the business at the same time? Like it sounds impossible from hearing yeah. what you... <laughs> well, I'm probably not the best student in the world, I'll have to admit, but... 
I did manage to do it. So I'm probably, yeah, one of the, not the best students in the world, but I, I'm known for cramming my studies. So yep. after that first year where I was doing Megal and I got the app off the ground, as you know, the course I was in wasn't fantastic and I realized that it wasn't what I thought it was. So luckily I had to, I was able to transfer based on some of my marks from VCE, which I think is like HSC, same equivalent. So based on my high school marks from graduating, I managed to get into a Deakin University, which is where I currently am, because I did quite well in high school. So they accepted me, luckily, and I wrote a letter saying, look, I didn't do well because the subject was horrible and it wasn't what I thought it was. And But yeah, the question was, so really handling schoolwork, it's a bit of a sort of juggling game. You need to be able to focus when you need to at school. But also, like for me, I know that my path, regardless of how I go in school, is going to be running my own business. You know it. That's where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that that's where I'm going. I feel there's nothing like I can't imagine a life where I'm not in control. I need to be in control of my own income, my own business, my own destiny, the whole lot. So it's really surrounding yourself with the people that are like that as well. That's really right. Helps. That's right. So one of my best friends, he's a year older than me and he's sort of doing the same thing I am. He just finished his degree at Melbourne University uh, doing commerce and I was doing mine at Deakin and we just clicked really well. And for me, I just cram a lot of my assignments and my exams right before they start, which isn't great, but I probably shouldn't be saying this uh, on a recording, but yeah. (laughs) That's fine. um, Yeah, uh, that's the way I handle it. And it works for me because I've got, I know which direction I'm heading. So even if it takes me a little longer, so I'm doing my current course, three subjects every semester instead of four. And I did two at one stage as well instead of four. So it gave me a bit more time to work on the business, but at some stage, I'll, I do want to finish the degree. So yeah, you're pacing your, you out, which is like a good way to manage both. But why, why do you need the degree, do you think? Was it your parents that want you to finish the yeah, degree? Yeah, 100%. For me, um, <laughs> that's, that's literally, I think, 90% of the reason. Yeah. I think it's 90% of the reason for 90% of the entrepreneurs out there in the same spot. Obviously, I think our parents have grown up in a really different generation. They've grown up knowing that a degree is a secure job that if you've got that piece of paper, a lot more doors open up. And I can understand that in their point of view, but there's also that they need to accept that the decision, everything has changed. I really can't see a lot of the value in the schools much as there would have been back in their day. The mindset is still the same. Like the university and the high schools, they still work on the same mindset of our parents. Like oh, yeah. you have to get a degree. It's just that just a few of us see another mindset, <laughs> like, oh, like being yeah. in control of what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And then I think that like in these universities, like this, for me, when I go sit in a lecture or if I'm sitting in a tutorial class where they're teaching a subject and I'm still doing this now, mind you, I've still got, I think, another 10 more units or something to go till I'm graduated. But when I sit in class, I feel like I'm actually getting stupider. <laughs> so yeah. I sit in class and I feel like the things that are coming out of the text, coming out of the tutor's mouth don't make sense to me because they haven't been there and accomplished what they're teaching, number one. So I don't like learning from people who haven't accomplished what they're talking about. So it's like saying, I'm not going to go learn tennis from someone who's a a soccer player. It doesn't make sense to me. But he's read Um, about tennis. Exactly. (laughs) He's read about it. So, And I had the same issue in high school as well. I was studying economics or not economics, business management. And the teacher there was just a teacher. So everything he read was coming out of a textbook. Yeah. And I think I almost got into sort of like classroom arguments. And we were all saying, well, look, that's not how it works or... They just couldn't relate to actually being there. And nothing frustrates me more because in the real world, if you want to succeed, if you want to make money, you learn from people who are already in that position and have followed that path. That's right. Well, um, I mean, it, it, the problem is they make it hard to get in. Like I'm an entrepreneur and I want to get into academia to be that person that actually build businesses yeah. and want to teach others. And it, they make it hard. They don't want people like us. Like no, they, that's they, right. I, and I can't look, I don't see why not because I think it benefits the students a whole lot more as well. Because number one, you want to be teaching kids because you're passionate and you've done that's what right. you're talking about. Exactly. Um, so you, otherwise, people are going to feel your passion about what you're teaching as well. You don't want to be reading out of a textbook, black and white, and just saying, here's uh, Maslow's, what was it, Maslow's hierarchy <laughs> needs, of yeah. needs or something <laughs> like that. The, the whole lot. And every kid's read it, they all read it out of the books. But at the end of the day, if you haven't gone there, you can't yep. talk about building a business if you haven't built a business. There's no way around it. That's right. Um, and I know kids my age who are like other friends. I'm working in an office at the moment and we all range from like 19 years old to 25. And some people in this office are building million dollar a year businesses and they're 23, 24 years old. Wow. 
and they're killing it. And you just go into university and you see people talking about like dissecting. Today I was in class and they were dissecting the John West Tuna advertisement and saying, well, how should they have improved it? Why didn't they do this? And even the tutor was saying what was right and wrong. But they're not in a position to judge it when exactly. they haven't done it themselves. And nobody is going to be in a position to change those advertising. Like, Correct. You have to yeah. be like the marketing manager and like there'll be like five in Australia. So, oh, look, there's pros and cons, but ultimately, if I'm looking at it from my perspective and when I grow up and have children one day, I know that you need to be taught based on the real life examples. And I think that for me has benefited me mm. and that's attributed some of my success so far. And I think that's only going to help more. I mean, I attend seminars, I attend workshops, I listen to podcasts. Is that how you learn now? I mean, like podcasts yeah. and workshops? And, yeah. Every single day between, like, I don't want to sound like, a, like some sort of nerd, but every single day in the way, on the way to work, on the way to uni, in between classes, I'll have a podcast going. I've got my own podcast. Yep. Okay, There's, go ahead. Which podcast do you listen to? <laughs> and then, <laughs> and which what is podcast your... do I listen to? Yes. All right. So for me, I'm an online marketing sort of addict. So my favorite podcast, let me just open my phone. I'll read some of them out to you. <laughs> of course, yeah. From your no phone. Way, you've, got, you've got it from the horse's mouth. All right. Number one is Entrepreneur on Fire. That's the very first podcast I ever listened to that yep. got me into entrepreneurship in a podcast sort of sense. Yep. So John Lee Dumas does one every single day. Absolutely killer guy. He's probably at the highest end of podcasting, making up to three, four hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Also because I mean I started listening to him two years ago, but now he's more focused in web marketing, which is your area as well. Exactly. So, yeah. so at the end of the day, business in general and marketing, mm-hmm. you've got to know how to sell. And that's, that's what right. he's doing. Yeah. So I think we had a chat about this earlier before the show started and we were saying that it was something like eight to 10 months before he started monetizing his podcast. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. So huge. Like, And he set himself up before that to have a runway of that much time so he could afford to do that. But yeah. still, he was going relentlessly every single day interviewing, reaching out to people and just killing it, living on a very minimum wage for those yeah. six to eight months. Yeah, he was a so real, est- real estate agent. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so yeah. that's commission based as well. So that's it makes right. it even tougher. So you've <laughs> yeah. got to be a good salesman. Yeah. So that was that's one of them. Another one is Conversion Cast from the guys at Leadpages.net. Ooh. They're a, a landing page software, and they always talk about different tests that they run on with their clients. So one Ooh. example is they might have a certain amount of opt-ins on an email list, and then they'll say, "Well, we tested this against." a web page that had two buttons on there versus one that had one. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which one won by how many percent and why did they win? And they dissect each case study. So they do those. That's Yeah, that's a case study. That's exactly what you say. Yeah, it's like learning from a real case study. Yeah, so they do that with their big clients and users as well. So that's fantastic. Next one, which I absolutely love, is a marketer called Russell Brunson. If you mm-hmm. haven't heard of him, I definitely recommend. He just launched a book called uh, .comsecretsbook.com. So if you go to that website, you'll be able to get it. He's doing a free plus shipping offer. So uh-huh, nice. you'll be able to uh, just pay for the shipping and he'll send it out to you for free. And quality book if you're looking to get into online marketing, highly recommend it. He's, I think, doing about seven figures a month as well. So a month. That, a month. <laughs> so highly recommend him. His podcast is phenomenal as well. He talks, he's sort of a bit like my podcast where I sort of talk on the, like while I'm driving some of my thoughts, he interviews people as well. So it's a bit of a mix, really good for a marketer or a business owner that wants to really pick up their game. And one I just downloaded today and yesterday is Grant Cardone. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a ripper salesman. He's really into just learning about selling. So I'm midway through that. Say Um, his name again. Grant Cardone. So his podcast is called the Cardone Zone. So he talks about so making how selling is in every part of life as well. So you're either selling someone or you're being sold. And he talks about obviously there's selling in like you could be selling a product or whatever, but he also talks about selling where you're selling in your relationship. You've got to sell your kids on wanting to go to school. You've got to sell your boss on getting a raise. You've got to sell. Oh, why he's taking it to the next level? (laughs) Yeah. So it happens in all facets of life. And he really like drills it down to the point where if you can't really persuade people, your life isn't going to get any better because you want to live life on your terms. You want to really have be in control of your income and all of that. So highly recommend his stuff as well. Excellent. And then so you 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 sell your own podcast as well, right? Marketing on the Move? Yeah. So my podcast is Marketing on the Move. That's I do those pretty often. Um, I think we're up to episode 23, 24 or something like that. Yeah, I've just um, listened to 24, yeah. Yeah. So I interview different entrepreneurs, business owners, 
not just like marketers, but it's absolutely everyone. And I also just talk on my own as well sometimes. So if I'm in the car driving to a meeting or driving to the office or leaving uni and I've got something to share, I do that as well. So it's pretty <laughs> that, conversational and that's informal. on the move. On the move as much as it gets. Yeah, that's good. And so do you, do you read blogs as well or even books or? Yeah, so a couple of the blogs that I read, I've got my own blog, so I'll plug that first. That's of course. Uh, stephenesketzis.com so Stephen with a ph and e-s-k-e-t-z-i-s.com and that's where i just do all my own blogging i talk i review software i talk about marketing podcasting business owning the whole lot so it's a bit of a mixed bag and then i've also got some of my favorite blogs digitalmarketer.com they're phenomenal they're a u.s company they talk about everything from beginner marketing so running facebook ads podcasting and they talk about Everything. So you'll get a real good learning into the uh, online marketing and sales space. What other blogs are there? A lot of them are really online marketing based. So there's a couple of others. I am scalable. I am, oh, I am scalable. So it's I am and then scalable. They're a, a media. Well, the guy who owns it, Justin Brook, he's a media buyer and marketer for a lot of big companies. So he blogs about what are the trends in media buying. So Facebook, paid advertising couple of tricks there and another one if you're not familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk his content is absolutely phenomenal his stuff's great so garyvaynerchuk.com highly recommend that he's all over it with his he does a daily video sequence as well at the moment where he asks he answers questions for the followers yeah so they would be some of my well that keeps you busy my top blog yeah well that's it I mean you've got to keep your day busy otherwise you get bored so I'm definitely uh you get some good stuff though. I mean, yeah. you want to keep up to date with stuff like that. That's especially right. if you're servicing clients and working with people all the time. You want yeah, to know what's yeah. going. You want to be ahead of them. That's right. And so you did say um, that you surround yourself with people like you. So how do you find your support? Like, do you have mentors or the tutor at school or uh, the friends in your um, sharing space? Yeah, hundred percent. So going through even back at high school, there was probably one kid that I was friends with that had his own business and really I resonated with. And we were sort of friends, like I didn't know him that well, but we sort of kicked it off when I found out he was doing, he had an online business and was doing really well from like year 10. And then up through university, there weren't that many, like I sort of dibbed and dabbed in uni and was sort of interested in not, and there wasn't really people that were just there motivated to run their own business. So it's, Was it's there quite, a, an entrepreneurship club or something like that? Yeah, yeah, there was. I probably should have spent more time in it, but I think I got the gist that there was sort of more teaching about entrepreneurship, the sort of theory. It wasn't yeah. really actionable content that I could really like go in and say, yeah, awesome, you're running a business. How are your sales going? What are you doing? Everyone was sort of like, yeah, look, I'm thinking about doing a business. I like mm, business. I'm like, yeah. it's wasting my time. You're either doing it or you're not. There's no in between. Well, you need the good mass of people that wants to do it, but you also need a couple of people that are actually already doing it because otherwise it just doesn't. 100%, yeah. yeah. And then what happened was one of my family friends, he invited me to a networking event and there I met the guy I was speaking about earlier who ran his own business. We kicked it off really well, became really good friends. And then I was, while I was working on my app, he was doing some eBay selling as well, which I did a bit of, so I helped him out with that. And then, yeah, so I was having a chat with him and then I moved into an office where he was working uh, about six mm, months ago, okay. where I'm yeah. currently from. Yeah. And then he introduced me to a whole lot of people in the office who we're all roughly my age, mostly two or three years older, so 23, 24 years old, all with their own businesses. Everyone's obviously renting. Yeah. It's sort of like a shared workspace. So we're paying like we're, we're all – I've got two people in this room where I am now and then there's a few others in the other room and it's, we're all pretty tight-knit and we're all good friends now and everyone's doing some uh, really good work. And I think being here in the office, splitting up my time between uni, coming here, working on Tractasia, doing my podcast, blogging – you really start surrounding yourself with the right type of people. Th that's right. Because if you didn't have this space, that would have been so different. Yeah, 100%. Like it was good having a chat with him and we'd be on the phone during the day and whatever. But now that you're in the actual space, it's priceless because you're really the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's it. Yeah. So you want to be surrounding yourself with five people at a higher level than you. So I know there's people now across the hall that are doing, they're selling $4,000, $5,000 courses and they're making. 100k weeks 50k weeks Ooh. so they're doing crazy things yeah. and when i hear them on the phone across the hall while i'm doing my work hard selling someone into a, a mastermind which might be twenty five thousand dollars a year and they close them into that mastermind 
instantly that motivates me to get on the phone and make sure I'm yeah, still working. I'm not yeah. screwing around. I'm not mucking around. And you don't get that at uni. Like no, everyone's sort of no. sitting in the library. You're sort of working. Like it's good and you get that teamwork. But if you really want to take your entrepreneurship and make sure you're serious and stay on the right track and stay focused, you really want to have that mentality where you're always surrounding with people on the next level. So you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You always want to be the dumbest guy in the room. So you can always pick up on how are these guys making their money? How are they selling? What are they doing right? How can I improve? Because the minute you get complacent, things start falling apart and you start thinking you're too good and you start getting ahead of yourself and you may have made a bit of money, but then you lose it in the next day. And you always want to be at the step underneath everyone else around you so you can start building up. So talking about being too complacent, do you have any good stories of your failures or tough moments? Ooh, good question. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I nah, never fail. Um, <laughs> no, nah, never. So ooh, what can I say? One of the, I think one of the big ones was we had a, back when we had the app, the Megal app, we had uh, one artist share the app on her social media. So she was a DJ, quite well known, had like 50,000 Facebook fans, well known in Melbourne and around Australia. She shared the app, interviewed her. We got a, heaps of uh, downloads that pretty much the instant she shared it because obviously people heard about it and they loved it. But then, yeah, we, we were really riding that for a solid week. We thought, awesome, we're on the money here. Everything's going to go well. And then we, the server just crashed completely. Uh, we had a massive issue and like it was just, we just hit the ground and we couldn't do anything about it because the guy we was the developer at that time, we changed developer. So everything sort of fell apart around us and it was just, oh, it was hopeless. And then, yeah, I think it was sort of that we got complacent with what we, we weren't really expecting it. We weren't really on the ball and keeping an eye on things. Yeah, um, no backup plan or... No backup plan. And that was sort of, yeah, that was our undoing. So I think that's probably one of the failures there. Another one is when I was doing some uh, marketing... Uh, web design I wanted done this was early on in my website and I paid someone I think about three four dollars for the design and he just ran off with the money oh. <laughs> so I lost like 450 or 500 bucks to do a web design and no you bought, him again. You, you bought a lesson you listen yeah. <laughs> 450 dollar lesson right. <laughs> and it, it was an expensive lesson but it look you had to do it and that's something which you can only learn from doing that yeah, yeah definitely so I don't call this a failure. I call it like that's a normal learning. Like <laughs> you that's have it. To, you have to <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it could have been worse. I mean, if exactly. it could have been a three thousand dollar app, it could be anything. And I'm yeah. glad I learned it now before I'm spending more money. So yeah. we had uh, Adam Stone who was sharing that you know he had the same developer for two or three years to like he automate his business and everything. And then uh, three months ago, he found out that uh, his developer sold his codes to his competition. So that's <laughs> that's painful, you know. That is painful. And, what, and the thing is, yeah, the, you can't really take much of a precaution. No, I, I no, don't know no. If he was how, out. No, how do you protect yourself? Of course, he's signed NDAs. Of course, he did all that, but you can't protect yourself from that. No, no. His it's... best protection was he had a bigger share of the market. So yeah, well, that's lucky. Because yes. it could have been a lot worse. Yes. Oh, I, I remember because I even did like I've done everything. I, I don't want to brag, but I've done a little bit of everything. And it's all sort of like, I've just dipped in down. It gets me excited trying something new. And yeah. I, I, that's one of my things I need to focus more. But Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I think that's one of the aspects of my research. I find that when you're in that stage where you are, you have to be very curious and try everything. Then when you become a bit more mature, I can't put an age on it, but you know, 25, 30, then it's time to focus. But it's actually very important to try everything and to be very curious and to see what's out there. Because every entrepreneur keeps telling you, yeah, yeah, you have to be focused, focused. But you're like, no, not when you are uni, not when you're, <laughs> you're young. Yeah, like, well, you want to make sure you find what, you, what really resonates with you. You don't want to sort of just drive all in on something and then realize that it's not for you. Yeah, well, if you haven't been curious, you will not have tried this uh, Bachelor of Commerce and IT, right? And you will not have found out that it was the wrong choice. <laughs> 100%. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, no, definitely. You're 100% right with that. I mean... Like even with eBay, I started doing some importing from China for a little while and I was importing iPhone cases and it's really tough. I just wanted to learn. Every, I, one of my friends was doing really well importing and exporting and all of that. So I thought, look, let me, he made it sound easy. Obviously, everyone makes it sound easy when they're doing really well. Well, where they have traction, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I went and tried it, ordered, and I've never dealt with China before, so I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I ordered something and I paid by Western Union and then I later found Ooh. out Western Union's like the dodgiest, like all the drug dealers use it. 
<laughs> no <money> insurance. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So there's no reversal. Once it's gone, it's gone. And the lady's like, yeah, no worries. We'll pay by Western Union. It comes straight away. You'll get your order in half the amount than if you pay by deposit like through the bank. I'm like, oh, no worries. I think $200 and then it tells you when they've claimed it. And then I saw, yeah, claimed in Shenzhen or Guangzhou or wherever the province was. And then I'm like, awesome. So when's it coming? And then I just got blocked <laughs> on Skype. I was blocked on Skype and then uh, never heard from her again. So yeah. that was one interesting experience there. But later on, I found a supplier, got it working, and made a bit off eBay as well. And then, yeah, like you just live and learn. There's lots of these little mistakes. You've got to go around. There's no one right path. You've really just got to go out there and try and make mistakes. I think the fail the better. And then you just you just got to fail faster. That's the really the key. If you can fail faster while you're in uni, while you're doing things, obviously there's, you're not going to lose a lot of money. You're not talking like a whole house. Like, look at me. I'm 21. I'm not. All your listeners are probably at uni still, not married, don't have kids, don't That's have right. a mortgage. That's right. Yeah. So. How bad can it get? Once you're comfortable, worst case scenario, which most likely for a lot of people is your parents will support you to some extent yep. or you're pretty much on rent and rent's due and then what do you do? And that's when you've really got to step up and make it work. Say, look, I've got to do this. There's no other option. That's it. Once you're comfortable with your worst, like the worst case scenario, then you can be confident going forward and say, look, let's do it. I'm just going to go keep going 100%, maintain that confidence, maintain that certainty because people buy into certainty. If you're not certain about what you're selling, people sense it straight away. So you need to make sure you're 100% certain, go full throttle and just dominate it. Even if you fail, fail faster, keep pushing, keep pushing and be ridiculously certain in your product because that's one thing going, starting Megal, we were sort of, yeah, it's not a bad product. The design's good, but it's not good. And as soon as someone hears that, they say, well, what does it do? How's it better than your competition? You say, well, look, it's all right. Bang, straight away they know that, all right, these guys are, they're not confident in their own product. How is someone else supposed to be confident in you? Awesome. That's <laughs> one of the big things that you've got to, yeah, take away. And that's something like now with Tractasia, the confidence is just there. I know there's no one else that's better than what we do. We don't have, no one else has a better product and is going to support you better achieving your goal than us. So if you come to us, what you're going to get what you pay for. You're going to get more than you pay for. So we've got like competitors out there that have free alternatives, but at the end of the day, we deliver what we deliver and we know that we're, what I'm delivering you is going to be worth 10 times that. You've just got to make sure that they put skin in the game and actually go for it. So it's just all about, yeah, you fail faster and uh, hopefully you can get through those challenges earlier on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Is there any call for action that you've won from the listener? You already told them to fail fast, but um, <laughs> do you want them to follow your, uh, your podcast, for instance? Yeah, or yeah, have blogs, a listen or... to my podcast. If you want to reach out, you can always uh, search me up on Facebook. Just search Stephen Esketsis. I'm sure Julian will have me in the show notes yes. uh, where you can reach me and all of that. StephenEsketsis.com. Yeah, guys, just look, really go for it. If you're in uni and you're unsure, make sure a few of the things, I'll give you a few quick few tips before we go yep. just to make sure you're on the right track. Start with a revenue model in place. I think that was one issue I had. I just didn't know where I was going or how I was going to monetize. Always have a plan. Don't think that uh, it'll just come to you. Nothing comes to you. You've got to go out there and uh, make it happen. So make sure that you've got a revenue model in place from the beginning. Learn the hard stuff early on. So setting up that business, obviously getting an ABN, a business name, a trademark for your product. Do you want to patent it? Don't stress about all these lawyer fees and little bits and pieces because I know that was one of our biggest setbacks that we were like, oh, crap, we're going to need a lawyer to look over the trademark. How are we going to submit this and this and this? We just thought, look, let's just get started. If we can get started and handle that later, it works to your advantage. Don't yeah, waste right. time on all these little things because the first thing you really need to be doing is just making sales. That's it. You should spend 90% of your time selling and 10% of your time on everything else, like whether it's editing your podcast, whether it's selling a product, uh, whether it's like maintaining your social media on your Facebook or your Twitter or your development. 90% has to be selling because you don't have a business if it fails. Everyone hates it. And as soon as you think sales is crap and scary and it's all of that, but at the end of the day, sales is what's going to keep your business open and make it successful. So you've got to be comfortable with selling. Like I mentioned, Grant Cardone, see his audio book, highly recommend it. And he'll really get you comfortable with being certain and selling. So that's the number one thing. And then, uh, yeah, you're in uni. So just go out there with some passion and certainty and try stuff out. Don't be afraid to fail. Fail faster and, uh, yeah, go out there and dominate it. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Time for a quick wrap up. 
Each student preneur's story is different, and what works for some people doesn't for others. However, I'd like to point out a few things in Stephen's journey that are similar to a lot of student preneurs I have interviewed for my research. He started by selling things to his classmates in high school. He also recognizes the fact that one needs to learn the ropes in the industry before to fly, but at the same time, he has a sense of urgency, like the successful 18 years olds are coming just right behind him. And finally, he values great sales skills and needs to be in control. So if you would like to be in control as well in your life, well, entrepreneurship is right for you. Thank you so much for your time, Stephen, and all the best in your adventure. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends and like-minded and student entrepreneurs. Catch next week of Student Entrepreneur on Wednesday. Meanwhile, keep breaking the stereotype and the mindset.